Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Epic Fantasy Romance. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Hmm. Ambrosia. Today is Tuesday, uh, June 28th. Almost done with June. Uh, halfway through the year, right? Hope that it is, um, that that feels good to you. I think I'm all right with it. It seems soon, but I think I'm also all right with it. I am also all right with the fact that it is not raining, which I feel bad about saying. Oh, if you're on video, there's an Isabel sighting behind me. She's out here with me in the secret garden this morning, poking around. Isn't she pretty? She is a blue smoke Maine Coon cat. And I really wanted that coloring and she has lived up to it. She's our 16 year old girl. So yes, um, being grateful for the rain, happy to have a sunny morning, uh, can coexist, right? I can, I can be both things. Uh, the rain's been fantastic. It has also been amazingly nonstop. Um, just not like us at all. Uh, yesterday I had to record inside because it was pouring rain and then I muffed up the recording. So apologies for no podcast yesterday. Um, so it goes sometimes, right? So, um, so yes, it's wonderful. Free water falling from the sky. Uh, it's, it was cold. It was, uh, downright chilly and uh and yeah no sun for for days which is unusual for us so i can i can be in this happy place of happy that the sun has come out happy to be back out in the grape arbor if only temporarily uh because we're to get more rain and uh my tucson family is envious that we are getting these monsoons so i will continue to be appropriately grateful so, um, I had a busy few days, my friends being here visiting, we had, um, just some wonderful touristy type escapades doing all the things they arrived right on time on Friday. So, um, everything went smoothly and I took them American shopping, uh, them being Canadians. That's what they wanted to do was go to a department store. I took on Saturday, I took them to Kohl's so they could go American shopping, which I feel like is not one of the sites of Santa Fe, but they were very happy. Oh, and I should say for those of you on video, you may have noticed this beautiful globe. Uh, the, the staff at Sephora, um, Kate and Tara sent me this beautiful Mova globe with the irises in it. We should move this up so that you can see it. Oh, that's probably a little close, but give you a little, if you're on video, you can see the irises. Isn't that beautiful? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So they gave me this beautiful globe. Uh, it moves with the earth's magnetic field makes it turn. It's like magic. Uh, we've given them to other people like at the nebula award ceremony. We gave one to Mary Robinette Kowal in thanks for her past service as president and gave her the moon, but I didn't know that they had non-planetary ones. And it's incredibly thoughtful of Kate and Tara knowing that I don't necessarily care about the planet ones that they gave me this beautiful, uh, irises. And I'm just, I'm just thrilled. And they also sent me a treat box full of, um, things from Hawaii. Tara who lives there sent me that. So I got things like macadamia nuts and, um, little pineapple candies and all of that. So they're very sweet. And I was, I was incredibly touched. <coughs> Excuse me. 
still dealing with allergies. I think it hasn't helped that it's been so cold and damp, but um, they're finally working out of my system, just getting the drainage out now. So, um, things to tell you. Oh, one thing that I did with my friends, Alex and Kelly, was uh, on Sunday morning, we went up to 10,000 Waves, which is this gorgeous Japanese spa. And we, uh, in Santa Fe, it's sort of on the mountain above Santa Fe. It's a great place to go. It's just um, the peacefulness in the air. And we soaked in the hot pools. We were rained on, but it was still okay. I've been there when it was snowing. Being rained on in the pools is less romantic, but it still worked. And we had wonderful massages that melted our bones. And it was, um, it was, it was a lovely day. Very relaxing. And we ended up canceling the party I was planning to have that night because rain, it was just too much deluge. Uh, even though it did clear up a little that evening, it was just too wet everywhere. And it was cold. Uh, you know, it was like in the fifties. So we, um, I knew everyone would want to be crowded inside and my house is too small for that. Maybe next time. I have to go check Isabel. Be right back. She did want to go back inside. So that was good. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, so at town thousand waves, they, you know, they have the big soaking pool and they also have a sauna. And so I was sitting in the sauna to dry out my sinuses. And there was another gal in there uh, who was very, um, was the right amount of talkative, not intrusively talkative, but invitingly talkative. And she said it was the first time that she had shared a sauna with a stranger since pandemic, which you know, it's like, it's funny how we note all of these little milestones, right? So, but she was interesting because we were just talking about various things. And she said she works at the bookstore at St. John's, which is the, um, I think it's a liberal arts college um, here in Santa Fe. Uh, unusual teaching method. I've, I've always been very interested in what they do at St. John's. But she said she um, runs the bookstore there, manages, I'm not sure exactly, but something along those lines which of course they have a bookstore there and it hadn't occurred to me to ever go there, but I was like, I should go there. And she said she also runs a bookstore part-time in Berkeley. Seems like such a very interesting person. And I said, well, that I approve of approve that I like bookseller type people because I'm a writer. And I've talked about this before. Like, how do you reply to, people who say things like, as soon as they find out you're a writer, they'll say, ask, what do you write? Which is marginally better than, have I heard of you? Um, and, and I've learned to reply to those questions by saying, are you a reader? So that, that way I can kind of drill down to what conversation are we having here? Um, because most people are not readers, right? And they just want to know if they've met somebody famous, which in my case, according to their bubble of the world, not. So, you know, it was funny. I talked some about all the really cool people at Megan and Charlie's wedding. Uh, one of the gentlemen there who was really just um, delightful to talk to as soon as he found out that I was a writer, that that was how I knew Megan and that I'm current president of CIFWA. He said, so he said, so you're famous. And I said, within a very narrowly determined bubble. Yes, I, I at least am, my name is recognized. And uh, you know, like what is fame? What is art? Who am I? And, and he said, yes, but within that bubble, if I told people I was sitting here with you, they would be impressed. And I was like, I don't know about impressed, but they would know who you were talking about. Always working against the ego stuff, right? So this gal just said that that was really cool that I was a writer. And I said, yeah, that, um, you know, that I'm making my living doing that, which is something I'm 
you'll feel very blessed to be able to do. There we go. So, um, yeah, it was uh, a nice conversation. And so then later, as I was getting ready to leave the pool, she was soaking again and she waved at me and she said, um, what's your name? So I can look you up. So I told her and I thought, that's a nice way to handle it. Uh, and no, I don't get that response very often, but I said to David, I thought that was part of her being professional. And he said, no, I think it's just her being an aware human being. I was like, well, maybe so. But I thought it was interesting to note, right? So I've been both reading and watching the Essex Serpent which is a six part mini series on Apple TV, um, recommended by Megan and Charlie. Kelly and Alex had also started watching it and tapped out after episode three. And they told me I would see why. And I understand why they did. I've only watched through episode three and I've been reading the book at the same time because I was intrigued. Um, author Sarah Perry, who's an English author, so as an aside, I've noticed lately that people have been saying English, like um, Neil Gaiman, they say English author, and Sarah Perry, they say English author, whereas I would have knee-jerk said British. Um, is this a change, or is this just me not being very aware before? Um, just curious. You know, it could be that it's... Uh, a clarification because you know like united kingdom what does british mean maybe it's um you know one of those language shifts we're saying are we not saying british anymore or are we saying british only in particular circumstances i need to ask somebody um who is english why that is so anyway um i've been reading this book and I am conflicted. I'm, I'm at 62%. So I like it well enough that I keep reading it, but I'm also not exactly enjoying it. The author has made certain choices um, that I that I do find, do I want to say problematic? Um, one thing that she does, because it's set in Victorian England, is that she uses a lot of references that would have been in common use at the time. And I know this is something that we debate about, that we don't want to whitewash the past and pretend that people didn't speak in certain ways. But for instance, she uses the phrase multiple times, multiple times, like at three, at least now. Um, and I think it says something if you use a phrase more than once. <laughs> well, one pause. I was trying to spare you my coughing, but I think I can uh, spare it for you, spare you from it anyway. Um, she uses the phrase Chinese whispers. So it's a, like a game of Chinese whis whispers, which I can see that she can't use telephone, which we would say today, but I feel like that that is, is, is racist, right? You know, it's, um, it's, it's an uncomfortable phrase to use and yes, accurate to the era, but do you have to put it in a book written in 2016 is when it was published. And I feel like, no, there are other things that she does that she wants to show, you know, like the position of women, um, I saw an interview with her where she says that um, feminism di didn't begin in 1970. It began in 1870, which I thought we all knew, but you know, maybe that's an English perspective. Um, and I don't know. It's so, so here's the thing. And, and this has been an ongoing conversation I've been having with some of the writer coffee people too. 
particularly Jim Sorensen, and to the point that he and I have been texting examples back and forth to each other as we encounter them, that there's a great difficulty in portraying an attitude that we do not sympathize with accurately or vividly while at the same time somehow communicating that we don't agree with it. And something that I've seen a lot of newbie writers do, um, and I recall one vividly from like a contest or um, critique where the book began with a very racist character saying really terrible things. And none of the other characters called it out. And, and several of us tried to explain to this author that you can't just have a character saying these things because it sounds like it's being put out there as truth. And she was saying, well, she's trying to show that this is a bad person. And it's like, yeah, but then you have to show that they're not a good person. And it's, it's a delicate line to walk. Interestingly enough, this particular author, um, I found out later is a Trump supporter and therefore I'm, I'm sorry, you know, if you disagree with me, but I feel like this goes, this is a truth, uh, therefore is racist or at least believes in the supremacy of white people. So it's like, well, so all of that protesting was actually just protesting and not real, right? Which is, which is another thing, right? When people want to put things in their work that is racist or misogynistic and pass it off as being, oh, that's just what my character thinks. It's not what I think. And it's like, well, then you have to show us that. So one of the things that Jim and I have been talking about in particular, um, and I did not know this, was that the Rolling Stones song, Brown Sugar, is about slavery. And apparently I just never listened to the lyrics. I am uh, very, very late to this party, but Jim told me that. And, you know, because basically I only listened to the chorus, right? You know, it's Brown Sugar. Um, And it's a jaunty song and it's a sexy, rowdy, fun song, right? Well, apparently the Rolling Stones have taken it out of their rotation now. And uh, Mick Jagger wrote it in the mid nineties. And it's, um, but if you look at the lyrics, they're awful. You guys, it's, um, I'm trying not to say you guys, people, they're awful people. Uh, They are, um, you know, about, whipping black women and white men having sex with black women who are slaves. That's what the brown sugar is. It's not loving black women. It's black women as slaves. Maybe you all knew this. I know one of those things, that song had always been in the background and not something I'd listened to. So they've taken it out of their rotation. Mick Jagger says he wouldn't write it the same way today. Keith Richards, who co-wrote it, says he doesn't understand what the big deal is and that he thinks they should still play it. Um, I think Keith Richards is also notably an anti-vaxxer. It's so weird to me how these things just march along hand in hand. So we were talking about this, like Mick Jagger said that it was supposed to be, um, what speaking against slavery, against black slavery, but there's nothing in the song that, that shows that the narrator of the song disapproves of it. Uh, and there's nothing in, as Jim pointed out, nothing in the melody that it is a very jaunty, happy, sexy song. So that makes it seem like the narrative is okay. And we were comparing it to, or I brought up the comparison, Jim wasn't familiar, um, Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, which is about black people being lynched, right? And the strange fruit hanging from the trees. And so we were using that as a comparison that strange fruit makes it abundantly clear that this is a terrible, awful, horrible thing. But the song's written all in these minor chords and the 
lyrics make it clear that this is a terrible, awful thing. So I think you have to be really careful when you want to show that something is terrible. It, it's a it's a delicate line to walk. If you want to put a character in your books who is like a tyrant or so forth, um, you have to make it clear that everybody recognizes that they're a tyrant and that they're awful. And sometimes, you know, like readers might complain that it's over the top. I think I would rather go on the side of over the top than, uh, than let it be thought that this is okay. So, um, this is the thing I'm thinking about a whole lot lately. When you show a society, and, and this is something Sarah Perry is doing a whole lot. She's put a lot of themes into this book. And she said in this interview that I read with her that she wanted to show um, the boundaries between faith and superstition. She has a vicar in it who is played gloriously by Tom Hiddleston in the show but that he is also a rational man. Um, I'm not sure it's working. The other thing that's not working, and I'm going to get into Spoilerville and then sign off. So if you don't want to know, now's a good time to sign off. But they call it a romance. And she's kind of fallen into the syndrome of authors who think that they're smarter than the bulk of the genre. So she's said things like, um, oh, that she doesn't really believe in the strong female character, uh, she, which, you know, that can go either direction. But she's also said that she really wanted to write um, a female monster because there had never been a titular female villain. And I was like, never? Really? <laughs> um, yeah. But that's not having an awareness of what's being done in other parts of the genre other than like literary, right? You know, she's talking about Daphne du Maurier and Mary Shelley, you know, and ignoring the fact that there's a whole lot of stuff being written out there. That's maybe like not important enough to notice stuff that uh, you all read and write. So where was I going with that? Oh, the spoilery thing. The romance, the vicar is married, happily married, and the wife is in the book. And I find the love affair between the vicar and the uh, main female character uh, very compelling. And, and that may be part of what's uh, drawing me along is that I'm very interested in the merging of their personalities, the friendship that they've built. But yeah, it's... Um, you know, the wife is dying of consumption and it is a, it's a violation of the, of the romance tenets. Uh, it's walking a line that, that she probably is not aware exists because she's clearly not a romance reader, right? She's a literary fiction person. So that's a lot of thoughts for today, but that's, uh, all what's been on my mind. Let me know what you think. I always enjoy it when you guys let, when you all let me know what you think. And um, I will talk to you all again on Thursday. You all take care. Bye-bye.